You're watching our continuing coverage here from Davos 2023 to talk to us about the outlook for the year ahead. Joining us, joining us is Ken Rogoff. Uh, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us here in Davos. It's good to see you back here. It's good to see you as well. Uh, what's the indications? What are the signals that you're picking up? There are many camps. Some believe that we are headed into a mild recession. Others believe that we're talking ourselves into one. And there are others that believe that we are probably going to see... a, a significant pain from this point in time. How do you look at the world? Well, I think either it's going to be a borderline or very mild recession, or it could be a deeper one. I mean, curiously, global warming has helped because Europe and North America have had milder winters. It's kept energy prices down. Uh, China, surprisingly, decided COVID zero, maybe we're getting rid of it, and short term, that may lead to a boost to global growth. But I think underlying it's still very difficult, uh, still continuing war in Ukraine and Russia, uh, rising global interest rates, or at least high global interest rates because of inflation. Uh, I mentioned uh, geopolitics. And I think China, although in the near term, it may do well, everybody's been locked up and they wanna go spend money. But I think longer term, China has a lot of problems and won't be the growth engine that it was over the last decade. Uh, uh, let's talk about China because you're absolutely right. We have seen China slow down and we haven't seen this pace of growth for China since the 1970s. Uh, and uh, while the expectation is that there will be a rebound primarily because they've now decided to reopen, what are you most concerned about uh, when we talk about China in specific over the next few years? Well, I think there are a few things. One is I think they've come to the end of the line on their growth model. Their growth model had uh, featured tons of construction, roads, bridges, apartment buildings, offices, like we haven't seen outside Spain and Ireland just before their collapse. And yes, it's wonderful, anyone who goes to China, but it's way overbuilt in places, particularly in the, the smaller cities, which are a lot of the country. So no matter what the government does to real estate and infrastructure, that day is passed. Secondly, the centralization of power uh, has, can't be good for growth. I mean, it, it was already centralized. And not only has President Xi centralized it more, he's gotten rid of a lot of the technocrats. China had some very good technocrats. He seems to have gotten rid of them. Uh, obviously, there are geopolitical tensions. Uh, there already were from the Trump tariffs that Biden decided, well, I don't like anything President Trump did, but we're going to keep those tariffs. And then, of course, with how Russia and Ukraine, which is the biggest wild card in the global economy, if that gets worse, and as I suspect China still stays with Russia, that's going to make the geopolitical tensions worse. You know, uh, since we are talking about China and the expectation is that in this era where geoeconomics is going to uh, shape the narrative and shape decision making, uh, there are, again, two camps. One camp which believes that anywhere but China is going to be the future, uh, or there is China plus one, and that's where countries like India, Vietnam, etc., emerge as alternatives or tier two suppliers. Uh, how do you see this reshaping of, of the China strategy of globalization as we've seen it? It's a huge opportunity for countries like India because countries are looking at what, not just what is happening in China now, they're looking at what's happening in Russia. They have to worry that China is going to try to take over Taiwan at some point, and that could lead to a many-year cutoff. So I don't think any companies are pulling out of China, but they are looking to expand elsewhere. It's uh, all of South Asia is benefiting from this. India is benefiting, Indonesia, Singapore. And even companies are looking again at Korea and Japan uh, and places that they had pulled out of in terms of their investments. So I, I don't think everybody's piling back into China. I, I have heard it the other way. There are people who say it was all COVID zero. COVID zero is over. I'm happy to do business in China. But I think the geopolitical tensions are really going to last what Janet Yellen, our Treasury Secretary, calls friend shoring. I think this is going to be a trend that's going to play out over the next few years. A friend shoring, near shoring. I mean, yes, uh, I was looking at a report that suggested that every corporate presentation now talks about this as an area of focus, as an area of priority. But what else do you see change as 
many parts of the world are becoming increasingly protectionist, becoming increasingly insular. There are, of course, geopolitical friction uh, and, uh, and tension points at this point in time. How do you see this shaping trade and investment as we move forward? The WEF is, of course, uh, talking about global cooperation in an increasingly fragmented world. Are we going to see more fragmentation? Is that the true reality? Seems like it. It seems like we've entered a second Cold War. You never know. Maybe Putin will die tomorrow and some uh, charismatic, free democratic leader will take over in Russia and maybe China will decide they had gone too far and open up. But there are so many things, I think, pointing to more fragmentation, more caution. I do see defense spending rising all over the world. The United States is just starting. We spent half of what we spent at the end of the Cold War, at the end of the 1980s on defense. And we're back in the Cold War. Europe spends next to nothing. And expenditures in China are going to pick up Japan and then probably countries like India in response. So that's certainly a factor which also reflects those tensions. I want to add, I think, another thing that is over the global economy at the moment is that we had benefited immensely from interest rates just being super, super low. They helped governments. They helped consumers. They helped hold together the European Union. We haven't had emerging market debt crisis because interest rates have been so low. I don't know what is going to happen going forward, but I do believe that whenever you see interest rates fall so much as they did after the financial crisis, you shouldn't kid yourself and think that's going to last. So to be specific, the Fed's raising interest rates because inflation's high. I believe when inflation comes down to whatever it is they want, interest rates won't come down as far as they were before this all started. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's an important point that you make as well. But what do you make of the commentary that's coming in from the Fed? It looks very clear that, uh, you know, the Fed's not done uh, and doesn't expect that it will be done anytime soon. Well, I think that's right. I mean, I think, uh, like, there's been a little bit of good news recently, but the markets maybe are overplaying it. Wages have a long ways to go. Wages have not kept up with inflation. And although goods prices are coming down, there's still a lot of pressure on wages in the service sector. It's hard to get workers in the service sector in the United States. That's three quarters, 80 percent of our output is the service sector. Restaurants and hotels can't find workers. Banks have trouble finding tellers. Yes, they can find somebody to do really high tech stuff, but to find uh, office workers is hard. There's, there's a lot of upward pressure on wages. And I, and I have to add, amid that, there's this tension between firms and workers of how much do I have to be at work in order to get paid? And I think the firms feel it's much less efficient to have everybody, so people at home so much. And people say, well, we don't want to go back. And that creates cost pressures regardless of how it plays out. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, speaking about uh, what the markets are doing at this point in time and the expectation or the hope again is that the Fed may start to slow down. Uh, but outside of that, where are the pockets of vulnerability that you see? I mean, we've, we've seen a blowout as far as the crypto markets are concerned, uh, and that's clearly one area of pain. But where else are you, are you looking there where you feel concerned? Well, I, I think the real concern would be if we have a significant recession, but inflation doesn't quickly come down. And I think that's quite possible, could happen, because the inflation is very slow moving. It's very deeply embedded. So even if we enter recession, inflation may not end. And therefore, the central banks won't bring interest rates down as much as people think. And when you have recession and interest rates still high, there are pockets of vulnerability. It's hard to know where, but maybe in places we're not used to looking for them. So I'd pick as an example Japan. They haven't had interest rates be above zero for ages. They haven't had inflation for ages. If suddenly it moves up, there are a lot of things that could be bared. Obviously, Italy has benefited from the really, really low interest rates. And the Italian finance minister, I'm sure, will say here that he's very worried about what happens when interest rates go up. Uh you talked about Japan and uh, Italy and, of course, the U.S., but uh, let me get your thoughts on India as well. I mean, the last 12 months have, uh, you know, been 
uh, resilient for the Indian economy. The hope is that we're going to be able to build on this. How do you look at India at this point? Well, there's no question that India has been the most resilient major economy uh, and, uh, you know, looks to be doing better than the other big emerging markets. And I think there are a lot of reasons for this, but one certainly is that India has a big domestic market. And they've, but there have been policy changes of trying to deal with all the bad loans in the banking sector. You do get oil at discount compared to other countries. Uh, so when people get negative about the world, often people say, well, what about India? And I, I think it is a bright spot. I don't know that it's enough to turn the global economy around. India also, uh, for example, some of its exports are more resilient to supply chains. The tech sector has been very resilient in India. So, you know, by and large, uh, India seems to be resilient. Even if there is a recession, maybe it won't be as dramatic in India. Yeah, we, we, yeah, I don't think anyone's talking about a recession just yet in India. But, uh, you know, let me end by asking you about, about where, where are the silver linings, if any, at this point in time? The conversation here that I've had with business leaders, technology, innovation, uh, talent, uh, and that being the road out of uh, the, the slowdown, that seems to be the big bet at this point in time. The private sector, healthier balance sheets, and whether they're going to be able to do the heavy lifting. Where do you see the silver linings, if any? Well, I suppose the silver lining is the world's a very diverse and creative place, and it's easy to see things that are going wrong, and sometimes you miss the things that are going right. And so certainly innovation can surprise and solve some of the problems. That said, we live in a world where structural reform is a dirty word. Uh, the IMF is hesitant to say it anymore. Having things to improve your underlying growth prospects to make the economy more efficient. People at a place like this are much quieter about that than they used to be. But you can't get out of this without moving in that direction. What will be the biggest challenge that central bankers are going to have to face uh, through 2023? Well, they face a very difficult 2023 because my guess is inflation will not come down all that much more. It's going to come down, but not to what they want. And they have to decide when to stop hiking rates because when you hike the interest rates, the impact on the economy might be, uh, th you know, three quarters, a year and a half later. You don't know where you're going to be. So they need to stop hiking before inflation ends. But then they might decide they waited too long. It's, a, it's very tricky when they painted themselves into a corner and it's not easy to get out of it. It is not easy and it is going to be a challenging year for central bankers around the world. Ken Rogoff, always a pleasure. Appreciate you joining us here in Davos. Thanks very much for your time here on CNBC TV. Thank you so much for having me and I hope you have a great Davos I hope as well. you have a good Davos too.